When A Christmas Carol was feverishly written and published within six weeks in the winter of 1843, Charles Dickens was just hoping for a quick hit to reimburse some debtors, as well as an effective tool to spotlight the plight of the poor. Of course, what it became was a blueprint for the quintessential Victorian Christmas, and by extension, the way we celebrate the holiday today. Charles Dickens has often been labelled as the creator or inventor of the modern Christmas, which is definitely definitely implied in the 2017 slightly saccharine film The Man Who Invented Christmas, which is a fictionalised reenactment of Dickens creating his infamous Christmas story with plenty of interruptions from Ebenezer Scrooge himself. In fact, Dickens was just one of many that wanted to resurrect the then neglected holiday of Christmas back to the populace, re-establishing the Victorian Christmas not so much as a religious celebration but a family orientated folk festival many of our Christmas traditions come from around about this time the same year the carol was published the first Christmas card was sent the same decade saw Christmas trees come to Britain Christmas crackers were invented presents were given to children and carol singers were once again welcomed into church even the idea of having a white Christmas in Britain which is actually quite unusual comes from Dickens as he was born at the end of what is known as the Little Ice Age and he certainly would have been aware of the fabulous ice festivals that were held on the Thames. A Christmas Carol itself became one of these annual traditions. Within months of the novella's release, stage adaptions were produced. Dickens himself would regularly give public readings, which became a big moneymaker for him in the years to come. It was therefore inevitable that decades later, at the birth of cinema, the already familiar character of Scrooge would appear again and again and again with each retelling having its own take and while each film may have been set in Victorian London it often said more about the time that that specific film was produced as the Christmas Carol has this unique wonderful ability to adapt to fit a different audience for a different time in this video I will be taking a look at how A Christmas Carol evolved on film in the first half of the 20th century. From the dawn of cinema to the 1951 classic adaptation with Alistair Sim, which happens to be my personal favourite. In 1901, the first screen interpretation was created in a much truncated form, this being a period when the novelty of the moving image took precedence over the narrative. It's not complete, but it's a curiosity from the very early period of cinema and focuses solely on the appearance of Jacob Marley. As cinema evolved and narrative filmmaking became standard, the pioneer filmmakers in Britain and the States turned to literary classics to adapt. In the United States, SNA produced the first now lost adaption in 1908. Then the Edison Company followed suit by producing two adaptions in 1910 and 1914. As with many of the silent adaptions, this was a summarised plot with one Christmas spirit. It is also interesting to note that many of these early adaptations lacked title cards, indicating that despite this being from a time when mass entertainment was limited, the majority of the audience were familiar with the story. I've only watched four of the silent versions, 1901, 1910, 1914 and 1923. Based Basically, they are recreations of the most famous scenes from the novella. As a fan of silent cinema, I have to say that these films do lack artistic merit, though this is completely acceptable in this era of early cinema. However, there are a few interesting examples of early special effects, and these films are cute little curiosity pieces. In 1935 came the first sound version, and within a minute, I missed the silence. Scrooge 
Scrooge was played by Seymour Hicks, a veteran of the role having played the character on stage for 30 years and had starred in one of the many silent films. Hicks's performance is very loud and histrionic. This isn't helped by the poor sound recording. The visual mood of the film is dark and dingy. Now this might be down to film deterioration or it could have been directorial choice. But as this was a low budget film, one of the British quota quickies, I suspect the darkness of the film is actually to cover up the poor quality of the sets. However, the result is that it captures a poverty stricken London. Scrooge himself is a bit tattier than usual. This is a surprisingly unromantic adaption. It feels cold and bleak. However, this film clearly had a limited budget. The Ghost of Christmas Past is a light. The Ghost of Christmas Future is a shadow. We don't see Jacob Marley. His scene is very reminiscent of The Invisible Man. Strangely, near the start of the film, the narrative briefly pauses and we have a surprisingly lavish scene which involves the Lord Mayor's banquet. And it made me ponder if this is where the budget went or are we in a different film altogether. The film intercuts these scenes with the poor gathering outside the gates and together with the rich everybody sings the national anthem in a propagandist display of social unity at the height of the depression when hunger marches were impacting the country. The film's final scene is unusually set in a church with Scrooge joining Bob Cratchit at a carol service. I say unusual because while the carol does often make reference to religious aspects of Christmas with the whole overall Christian message of redemption as well as the scenes at the Ratchet house. He told me he wasn't going to feel shy if people looked at him because he was a cripple, as it might be pleasant to them being in church to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. But bless us, everyone. It's only in the 1930s adaptions we see Scrooge clearly embrace the Christian side of Christmas. However, it's not overly laden with Christian dogma. Critics and historians have often commented that it's a tale that satisfies both the Christians and the secularists. In the 1920s, there were no American screen interpretations of the carol, but with the outset of the Depression, the tale once again regained popularity. Franklin D. Roosevelt was said to read the novella to his family every Christmas Eve and radio adaptions became an annual custom. Between 1934 to 1953, the voice of Lionel Barrymore was what the majority of Americans associated with Scrooge in the many radio broadcasts he performed in. It was naturally expected that Barrymore would play Scrooge on screen. In 1938, MGM went into production in what would be Hollywood's first talking Scrooge. It was David O. Selznick that first brought the idea creating lavish productions of Dickens' work. Selznick had left MGM by the time work started on adapting The Carol, but the studio was still riding the wave from the success of the great costume dramas he had produced. It was naturally expected that Barrymore would play Scrooge. Indeed, plans were made to cast him, but due to his increasing paralysis, Barrymore pulled out. Lionel Barrymore's Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life is the closest that we would get to seeing his Scrooge on the screen. In the meantime, MGM, rather unsensitively, decided it would be best if he introduced the actor that had been given his role. Well, I've been assigned one of the most pleasant tasks I've ever known. I'm going to introduce to you a character I've loved for many years. <laughs> Strangely enough, when you first meet him, you're going to loathe the very sight of him. Reginald Owen is fine. He gives a capable performance but fails to bring much emotion to the role. The film is also guilty of creating a London that resembles a pretty Christmas card. It's too bright and cheerful and it's very obvious that MGM is more interested in projecting romanticised expectation than any form of reality. Bob Cratchit's home looks pretty big with wallpaper trinkets, reasonable furniture, tea and cake. He, he's doing okay. Terry Kilburn is a likeable, charming child actor. His tiny Tim just isn't that tiny. And with his apple dumpling cheeks, he looks 
perfectly healthy. So when Scrooge asks the spirit of Christmas present if the child is going to die, it, it just seems unearned. Tiny Tim also looks like he could easily smother Bob Cratchit when he is riding on his shoulders. Like the 1935 production, there is no social commentary. In fact, producer Joseph Mankiewicz seemed intent in representing his Dickensian London as classless, with Bob acting less deferential to Fred. The Cratchit's financial difficulties are purely down to Bob getting fired, and the whole film promotes community and family. The film does look gorgeous and has impressive sets and fanciful effects. There is a lot of genuine warmth in the scenes, especially with the Cratchits, no doubt as Gene Lockhart was playing opposite his real-life wife and daughter. I just feel this MGM production lacks the emotional punch and opts for mawkish sentiment over substance. It was 13 years later across the pond in Britain when we would see yet another Scrooge, this time with Alistair Sim as the miser and Brian Desmond Hurst in the director's chair. Once again, this Christmas Carol is produced while British cinema was embracing the work of Dickens. David Lean's seminal work on Oliver Twist and Great Expectations had led to a renaissance of Dickens' work, with many of these portrayals considered the superior productions, and this includes this 1951 film of Scrooge, or A Christmas Carol as it was called in the States. This film features a grimy, almost noirish view of Victorian London. This is a London that is inhospitable and full of shadows. Cheerfulness is not on every street corner, but poverty is. The poor in this gothic city are not happy with their lot, but they endure. Alistair Stim's take on Scrooge is in my mind the best. His Scrooge is quietly cantankerous, matter of fact, and speaks volumes with a deadly stare. He is less furious, more wary, and sees Christmas with an amused disgust. Throughout his experiences with the ghosts, we see the gradual transformation. He is haunted and remorseful, but argues he is too old to change. Something that resonates with the viewer. His redemption and change at the end is satisfying. Alistair Sim's talent as a comedy actor truly shines as he performs Scrooge as a giddy child, amused by everything. Yet his apologies, especially to Fred's wife and Bob, are deeply sincere. The film also marked a change in the way Scrooge was presented, developing a detailed backstory as an explanation as to why Scrooge acts as he does. However, this adaptation wanted specifically to focus on the obsession of making money and the distribution of wealth, something that was of great significance to a post-war Britain. Winning a war, losing an empire and establishing the welfare state meant that post-war Britain was looking to build a new world of social justice and state provisions. This film is the first to reinstate the ghost of Christmas Presents monologue regarding ignorance and want. Spirit, are these yours? They are man's. They cling to me for protection from their fetters. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both, but most of all, beware this boy. But have they no refuge, no resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? These words would have resonated with an audience in 1951 who had read and were familiar with the Beveridge Report of 1942, specifically in what he termed the five giants of post-war reconstruction, want, ignorance, disease, squalor and idleness. The addition of the character of Jorkins, purely invented for this film, is a critique on the thirst for wealth and power, seeing nothing or anybody but the never-ending pursuit of riches. He is a representation of big business, indifferent to the suffering that it can cause. The month that Brian Desmond Hurst Scrooge was released, Clement Attlee's Labour Party lost to Churchill's Conservatives, despite Attlee 
likely winning the popular vote and the film would have certainly seemed as a warning not to forget the five giants. The extended Ghost of Christmas past scenes show how Scrooge is easily corrupted after the personal tragedy of losing his sister and his love. This is a film that really built upon the original text and future productions are clearly inspired by this film. In fact, they would continue to explore the tragic backstory, sometimes with an almost Freudian psychoanalytical eye. Nearly 70 years after this film was produced, and 177 years after the novella was written, A Christmas Carol is still of significance today. As the global pandemic closed down theatres all over the world, several theatre companies have decided to restage A Christmas Carol online. There is something about this story that touches people when things are tough. A Christmas Carol reminds us that we need to believe we need to hope and we have to learn to empathise and care for our fellow man.